All right, everyone. Thank you for joining us today um, for the next section of the Idaho Clinicians for Climate and Health and St. Luke's Sustainability Program Climate and Health Lecture Series. Uh, just some um, bookkeeping. We have two more talks left in the spring series uh, on April, I think it's April 10th. Let me double check. Uh, yes, April 10th, we will have speakers talking about the health benefits of trees, uh, including what we're doing in the Treasure Valley to promote uh, tree canopy growth and diversity. Uh, and then on uh, May 8th, uh, Dr. Jeff Comp from um, Maricopa County Medical Facility will be talking about the uh, human health impacts of extreme heat. Um, and we'll be joined with a speaker from the city of Boise talking about heat mitigation strategies the city of Boise is undertaking. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Elizabeth Pinsky. Dr. Pinsky is a child and adolescent psychiatrist and pediatrician at Mass General Hospital, where she's the associate director of the Pediatric Psychiatry Consultation Service and at Shriners Hospital for Children's Boston. She received her medical degree from Harvard Medical School and completed consecutive residencies in pediatrics and psychiatry followed by a child psychiatry fellowship, all at MGH and MGH McLean. Her clinical interest focus is on the intersection of child mental health and physical health, including childhood trauma associated with medical care, fostering resilience in medically ill children. Dr. Pinsky believes that climate change poses the most urgent threat to children at that intersection of physical and mental health, and that clinicians caring for children have a responsibility to advocate for a rapid and just transition off fossil fuels. She serves as the Associate Director for Advocacy at the Mass General Center for the Environment uh, and Health, and is a founding member of Co Climate Code Blue, a Boston area climate action group for physicians and other health professionals. We are thrilled to have Dr. Elizabeth Pinsky today speaking about uh, climate change and mental health. Uh, please add your questions uh, to the chat and we will accumulate them. And at the end of her uh, talk, we'll have an opportunity for community responses. So thank you very much and take it away, Dr. Pinsky. Thank you so much for that uh, nice introduction. Let me share my slides with all of you. Um, so I have a, a really big topic today, which is climate, uh, climate change and mental health. Um, and I, I wanna get through this so that um, I'm excited to have some conversation with all of you at the end. Um, but before we start, you know, if we were in the room together, I would ask all of you in the audience, how many of you are experiencing some climate anxiety of your own? Um, and if you are like most audiences, many, many people would put a hand up. If I then asked you, you know, how many of you have a young person in your life, a child or a grandchild or someone you know who's experiencing some climate anxiety or some climate distress, pretty much everybody would put a hand up. Um, and we have a tendency when we talk about this as care providers, as in my case as a physician, to talk about it as if we're sort of observing it, as if it's something that other people experience. Um, when the fact of the matter is that this is one of the areas in medicine where we're literally all in the same boat because we're all on the same planet. Um, and so I was going to start by just telling you very, very briefly about sort of how I got here, what my climate journey has looked like. Um, and for me, it started, I think, actually a little embarrassingly late. I was a person who had always worried about the environment, cared about it, voted, donated money, done all of the things. Um, but I remember where I was in 2018. I was walking from the subway station to my home, scrolling on my phone when I came upon this headline related to the IPCC report, the United Nations report in 2018. And it really stopped me dead in my tracks. I started to do the math in my head about sort of how old were my kids going to be in 2040. And it really came to me in that moment that climate change wasn't this distant or hazy threat. It wasn't something I had to worry about for my grandchildren, but climate change was just really coming for me and it was coming for my kids. And I got very climate distressed, very climate anxious. And I really spun out a little bit started to have trouble sleeping at night. I was consuming too much information, you know, diving too deep, doing too much doom scrolling, threatening that, you know, we had to move and we had to hoard food and we had to do all kinds of crazy things. And I thought that I was doing a good job containing my anxiety as this went on for, you know, the days or weeks. I didn't think my kids were catching on to anything. Um, my son was five at the time. And there was one night at dinner where out of the blue, he said to me, Mama, the earth can never die, right? 
It's like Santa Claus and it can never die. And I had no idea what to say to him. I knew what to say in the moment, obviously. But here I was, I am a literal expert in talking to children about difficult topics. That's one of the toughest topics there is, you know, life limiting illness, disability, all of these things. And I didn't know more broadly what to do for him, how to help him cope with what I knew was coming, how to help him sort of gain the skills that he was going to need to navigate this future. And it was in that moment that I decided that if I didn't know, there probably were other people who didn't know too. And that I really wanted to bring together my sort of personal life and my professional life together in this area around climate change and mental health. And also that I was, you know, had some skills to be able to bring to that question. Um, and so with that, that is what brings me here today. And I'm going to try to cover these four points, um, keeping in mind that I would like to leave some time for questions at the end. First, that climate change impacts mental health. We'll talk about the broad pathways through which it does that. Second, that it is mostly children who are impacted and that while they are all at risk, not, our kids, not all kids are at the same level of risk. Third, that this concept of eco-anxiety, which we're seeing a lot, particularly in the popular press and that people are talking about, is real. But I don't want you to think of it as a mental illness. And fourth, that while it may not be a mental illness, it still really matters. And we need to think about how to help kids with it um, and what to do with it. And so with that, let's leap into this first topic, climate change impacts mental health. Um, and just to make sure that we are all sort of on the same page, Starting around the Industrial Revolution, we started burning lots of fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas. That, those, that combustion released lots of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Those are wrapping around the earth like a blanket, insulating it, trapping heat, and making it warmer. Um, and what I just gave you was an appropriate explanation of climate change for like an elementary age child, right? Um, and of course, Warming is not the only impact that the planet is feeling. There is this whole complex cascade of, um, of effects. The ocean is becoming warmer as it absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide. It's also becoming more acidic. We have rising seas. We have increased wildfires. We have lots of biodiversity, um, loss of land, not just to rising seas, but also just desertification. The air is not just hotter, but it's also wetter as it holds more moisture. And so severe weather is becoming more extreme. All of these different effects are happening. Um, and at the end of the day, they're impacting every part of the human body. So there really is no organ system and no medical specialty that isn't impacted in one way or another by climate change or by sort of that twin problem, air pollution, which is also related to fossil fuel combustion. And I think that over the last several years, for medical professionals and for the public, there's increasing understanding and awareness that climate change really is a human health emergency, that it's, you know, impacting our cardiovascular health, that it's impacting our respiratory illnesses, allergies, all of those things. Our understanding about the mental health consequences, I do think, has lagged a little bit, and that's what we're going to talk about now. We're going to talk about what are the pathways that climate change is impacting mental health, and we're going to talk about the direct effects through heat and air pollution, and then about the effects that are mediated through trauma. So one of the primary ways that climate change is impacting mental health is through heat. And all of us know that, like, when it's hot out, you just feel kind of miserable. You're grumpy, it's hard to sleep, it's hard to think. For folks with mental illness, and particularly for folks with severe mental illness, like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, their ability to regulate heat is actually impaired at baseline. They're less good at regulating their temperature related to sort of complex pathways. Um, we then give folks psychotropic medications that further impair their ability to regulate their temperature. So people with severe mental illness are extraordinarily vulnerable to the um, impacts of heat. Heat also impacts learning and academic achievement. We can actually predict per degree of warming how much are we going to impact kids' ability to, um, to learn. Um, just glancing around at sort of your neck of the wood, this is Salem, Oregon, um, just from this past spring. Um, the, uh, unsurprisingly, maybe kids who are Black, 
uh, or low income are less likely to have air conditioning in their classrooms. So you think about how this impact is also um, not distributed equally among kids even here in this country. Um, heat also impacts symptom severity in folks with significant mental illness. So these are sort of a variety of different studies that have shown violent suicide, mania, crisis presentations of PTSD, all of those are more severe when it is hot out. There are then the direct effects on mental health of air pollution. And we know that those are both chronic and acute. So in cities and parts of the world where folks are exposed to higher levels of air pollution chronically, we know that that causes increased rates of anxiety, depression, lower IQ in children. What's really interesting to me is that episodic poor air quality, so individual days with poor air quality, are also linked to crisis presentations, particularly of anxiety for children. Um, and exposure to air pollution has also been linked to dementia, to Parkinson's disease, and increasingly potentially even to some autistic traits in children. Thinking about things that are impacting the West, wildfire smoke is particularly toxic. We know that that's true in terms of um, impact on the lungs, but it also increasingly appears to be true in terms of psychiatric impact. So this is a very recent study that just came out last month looking at um, wildfires out West. Uh, Idaho was not one of the states that was included, but I believe it's Nevada, Arizona, California, Utah. Um, that showed a 6.3% increase in crisis presentations, particularly on days when the wildfire smoke was very bad. Um, and these effects are worse in the elderly and in women and girls. So those are the direct impacts of climate change on mental health mediated through heat and air pollution. But then there's the effects that are mediated through climate-related trauma. Um, and we have the most data and the most literature around acute exposure to climate-related trauma. So these are things like hurricanes, floods, wildfires, things that we know are becoming more frequent, more severe, and less predictable as the crisis deepens. And we have a whole, um, we have a, a very rich disaster literature that tells us that not just PTSD, which sort of makes sense if you experience a life-threatening event during a hurricane, you might have some PTSD related to that, but also that rates of anxiety, depression, substance use disorders, aggression and violence, and even suicide are higher in the wake of an acute exposure to a climate trauma. There are then these sort of like slower moving catastrophes, things like drought, famine, loss of land to rising seas or encroaching deserts, forced migration and civil conflict that can cause chronic traumatic stress, the kind of thing that we see contributing to these complex presentations of people who've experienced trauma. And the data shows us that that is absolutely linked to grief, loss of identity, many of the same difficulties that acute exposure can cause in terms of anxiety and depression, and also suicide, particularly in um, rural or farming populations. There's then this third category of exposure to climate-related trauma, what I choose to think of as vicarious exposure to climate trauma. And this is what has gained a lot of exposure here in the U.S. and the popular press over the last couple of years. The notion that awareness of the crisis, whether it's through the news or social media or whatever it is, is causing distress or despair. And this whole nomenclature has sprung up around this concept. The one that it gets used most frequently, I think, is eco-anxiety. But it's essentially the experience of fear, dread, grief, anger related to knowledge of climate change. Um, this um, word solastalgia is a word that um, has come to describe the experience of homesickness when one is already at home, but home has changed around them. Um, and I was, I was giving a talk recently, uh, this, this past fall, I guess it was, um, up in Vermont, and I added this arrow to my slide. And, and I did that 
because I was giving a talk in Vermont where the spring before there had been severe flooding, even some fatalities related to the flooding that happened in Vermont. And it was happening in a part of the country that previously had thought, people I think had thought that they were safe from climate change. And I, as the crisis deepens, I put in this area arrow because places that maybe thought their biggest problem was vicarious exposure to climate change, that was gonna be anxiety or worry about what was going to come. As the crisis progresses, those places are being exposed to acute, acute traumas. Um, and so the lines between who is at risk of acute exposure, who is at risk of chronic exposure, and who is at risk of eco-anxiety or climate distress is becoming increasingly blurry. Okay. So we're gonna talk now about the fact that children are at greatest risk because that risk isn't distributed equally. And I'm gonna bring us back to that slide that I had earlier that showed this you know, broad stroke, what are the big picture human health impacts of climate change? And what I would call people's attention to is that leaving aside the mental health consequences, all of these categories are experienced either more frequently, more severely in children. Um, and why is that? Um, it is, children are, uh, the WHO estimates almost 90% of the burden of climate change is borne by children under the age of five. Vast numbers of children are now considered an extremely high level of risk from climate change, and it's worsening all causes of infant mortality. There's a ton of different reasons why this is true, and there's an excellent paper by Pereira and Nado from the New England Journal in 2022 that goes over this. But there are biologic reasons that kids are just not little adults. They're at increased risk. There are both biological and behavioral factors that means that kids are, have increased exposure to um, the pathways that can lead to, to these health problems. And then kids have reduced adaptive capacity. So they're less able to respond to climate-related threats. Um, so kids um, bear the burden of asthma and allergies because their airways are smaller. They also take more breaths proportionately per minute, so they're inhaling more air allergens and also air pollution. Kids are closer to the ground and spend more time outdoors. Here in the Northeast where I am, the instance of Lyme disease, which is spreading both in latitude and altitude, um, is highest in school-age boys. In all of these different ways, kids are exposed to more of the, um, of the factors that can lead to climate-related illness and they're more susceptible to becoming sick from it. That is also true for mental illness and those mental health impacts of climate change that we've been talking about for all of these different reasons. So first of all, kids' brains are in development and they are more susceptible to trauma or to um, adverse experiences because they are developing. They are dependent on adult caregivers and the systems of care that are disrupted in a disaster. So things like schools being shut down for extended periods of time impacts kids more than grownups. There's temporality. So kids are simply going to live more years of their lives in a hotter, wetter, less predictable world. And then there's this last category of psychological vulnerability, which we'll talk about a little bit more later on in the talk. Um, it is critical, however, when we talk about kids' outsized vulnerability to these mental health impacts of climate change to acknowledge that not all kids are equally vulnerable. So climate change is a threat multiplier. It finds the existing inequities and it exacerbates them. It makes them worse. So kids who are black or brown or who are poor are more likely to be exposed to extreme weather events and to the trauma that can come from that exposure. They're more likely to live in areas that have what we call amplifying hazards. So that might be chemical infrastructure or you know, energy-related infrastructure or electrical plants and things like that, that then make extreme weather events more hazardous in their aftermath. So it's more dangerous and you're more likely to experience the extreme weather event. Infrastructure may be less able to withstand climate-related events, and that includes mental health infrastructure, both physical infrastructure and now that so much is happening in terms of telehealth, digital infrastructure. And then kids are simply more likely to be exposed to dirty air and to hot temperatures if they live in a community that's largely Black 
or where people have higher levels of poverty, e decreased access to green space, less green cover, and heat islands. So neighborhoods may be physically several degrees hotter than, um, than neighborhoods with, um, that are wealthier or that are whiter right next door. And I think at least this sort of like makes sense to us intuitively. People who are vulnerable are more vulnerable. Um, climate change makes inequity worse. But I, I like to sort of turn that on its head a little bit because it's not just that climate change makes inequity worse. Inequity is like fundamentally the underlying problem that makes climate change possible. The folks who experience the worst impacts of climate change are those who are least responsible for emissions, and particularly thinking globally in terms of low and middle income countries and low lying countries that are experiencing the heaviest impacts and have done the least to cause the problem. This is an essay by Hop Hopkins from 2020, where he describes this really, I think, effectively. This article is absolutely worth a read. But we could not have the systems that we have and the systems that we continue to live with if we didn't accept basically that someone else is gonna bear the consequences of the carbon that we emit. The system simply couldn't exist the way it does if we didn't accept that, um, that there was injustice at its core. Okay. So we're gonna move on from that to talk a little bit about that third category of trauma that I, that I um, hit on earlier, this question of eco-anxiety. I'm gonna start by showing you guys this cartoon. This young koala has a mental health problem. And if we were, if we were in the room together, I would ask all of you if you think the koala has a mental health problem. And so the koala's been exposed to trauma, right? Looks like he's maybe been exposed both to acute trauma and to chronic trauma. So certainly I think he may have some post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, he is probably at increased risk of anxiety and depression. But what is the problem with this cartoon, with this way of thinking about it, that this koala has a mental health problem? The obvious one is that we're pathologizing the koala's very real experiences, right? Anxiety is adaptive. Anxiety is something that we have to alert us to an oncoming threat and to give us time to prepare for it, right? It's what allowed, you know, cave people to escape the saber-toothed tiger back, uh, back in the day. And I would say that more than that, in this case, Climate anxiety or eco-anxiety or whatever we want to call it is actually a form of health. It's a form of connection to the earth, to loving the earth, loving the people and animals that are on it, and, and to caring. So to say that this is a mental health problem pathologizes something that, that I would argue is not at all unhealthy. The other problem with saying that this young koala has a mental health problem is that it is individualizing the koala's distress. So it's making the distress the koala's problem. When what's missing from this cartoon is who cut down the eucalyptus trees, right? So it's failing to acknowledge that the larger problem is the system, um, and in this case, the fossil fuel industry that has caused the damage and focusing instead on what the koala is experiencing. So that said, it is problematic, I think, to think of this as a mental health problem. Um, and sometimes even the term eco-anxiety can sound as if we're pathologizing something. Um, anxiety is thought of as a disorder a lot of times. Um, but I still think it matters a lot. This is a study that was done in 2021 that was important for a few different reasons. One of the reasons that it was important was that prior to this, most of the data that we had about how much climate distress young people were experiencing was from the global north. So it's from the US and Australia, and the UK, and places in the world where um, sort of young people weren't bearing the brunt of climate related disasters. This study looked at 10,000 young people in 10 different countries, including in the global north and in the global south. And what it showed us was that distress about climate change, worry about climate change is actually very common. 
I would wager actually that if the study were, were repeated today, these numbers would actually be higher. One of the findings from the paper was that, that was important was also that young people who had the most distressed feelings about climate change were also the most likely to feel that they had been abandoned or betrayed by the adults in their lives and specifically by, um, by governments. And then I'm just gonna pause here for a minute. Those are sort of the feelings that young people had about climate change and they were quite worried. These are the thoughts that young people had about climate change. And this study I think was quite sobering for many people. Um, that 43% feelings about climate change affect my daily life and functioning, that was actually higher in parts of the world and in countries where climate change impacts were being felt more severely. And that 41%, I'm hesitant to have children, that has been replicated in other studies. That was not just this, this study that found it. So while we don't want to say that climate anxiety is a form of mental illness or pathologize it, it is very common and it is impacting a lot of young people. So with that said, climate anxiety is not a form of mental illness, but it does matter. Why does it matter? And I would say that that is in large part because climate distress, climate anxiety blocks climate solutions. So folks who are so worried about climate change that they either choose to be in denial, can't even think about it and totally disengage, or become completely panicked and are you know, paralyzed by that anxiety, can't enact climate solutions. So we actually do need to think about climate distress and how to help young people with it, both because it doesn't feel good and because it causes suffering but also because it interferes with the things that we need to do to actually address the crisis. And so I'm gonna to talk just a little bit about um, how to think about that or how I think about it and about the fact that those climate emotions and climate action are related. Um, I'm gonna pause here though to say, um, you know, it is talks like this sometimes that can make people feel climate anxious. And I think it is really important, as I know there are um, both health professionals and non-health professionals in our audience, it is easy to, um, to fall into hopelessness and despair. And that's sort of what we're going to talk a little bit about at this point in the talk. I want to remind people that we have a ton of climate solutions and that we are lucky in healthcare in particular because sometimes the things that we need to do to solve the climate, climate crisis and to sort of mitigate the problem, they have outcomes that are months or years or even decades in the future. And that can make it hard, I think, to feel motivated to make the changes that we need to make because it's the, the benefits are sort of so far in the future. The health benefits of climate action are really, really rapid and really, really exciting. So this is some data from um, uh, fossil fuel powered plants being decommissioned in California and looking at the rates of preterm births for women who lived um, in close proximity to those power plants. And you could see significant reductions in preterm births within one year of decommissioning those power plants. It's hard to think of anything in medicine that we do that sort of can affect change that quickly. This is data from Pennsylvania from co closing down coking plants, which are very, very dirty and produce um, a lot of air pollution. And this, this like really knocks my socks off. This is from a study just back in 2023. Closing down those super polluting dirty coking plants resulted in a 42% reduction in cardiovascular presentations to the ER in a week. So I said back, back here that it was hard to think of anything we did in medicine that was sort of this effective. Can you think of anything that would reduce cardiovascular emergencies in one week? We have such powerful solutions and the benefits we don't have to wait to see. Doing the things that we need to do to address the climate crisis, there are health co-benefits that are immediate. 
um, and really, really satisfying. So I do want to sort of orient us towards those solutions and the fact that there's actually a ton that we can do, and specifically as health providers, that there's a ton that we can do. So how else can we support young people and, frankly, ourselves with our climate distress? The first thing I would say I will take straight from Mr. Rogers, who said, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. And what I mean by that is basically that we need to talk about it. Young people who feel lonely with their climate distress or feel that they aren't allied with the adults in their life suffer more. It's, it's harder to feel that you're worried alone. If you do have a young person in your life, or even an adult in your life who's distressed about climate change, it is okay for them to have strong feelings. And we want to avoid minimizing or patronizing young people. Um, their fears are, are, are valid and they're worried for good reason. Um, monitoring dose and sources of media is a big one. When I was talking about sort of my own episode of climate distress at the beginning of our time together, I said that I was, I was doom scrolling a lot. Doom scrolling is not actually a form of climate action. It is a form of avoidant hoping, um, and it doesn't do anything to solve the climate crisis. So certainly staying informed is important. Um, we can't control all of the media that young people consume, um, but being mindful about what the dose of negative news is and also whether we're getting it from balanced sources is really important. I encourage people to keep in mind that the goal is not to do something about the anxiety, to make it better or to limit it. Um, what we're trying to do is to enhance self-efficacy. And what is the definition of self-efficacy? The sense that you can do something and it matters. We want to help people realize that they can do things that make a difference. And also engagement, help people um, actually be taking climate action. Managing adult anxiety, another mistake I made with my own kids, um, oftentimes young people feed off of whatever it is that we're worried about. Kids always know if you're worried. And so making sure that you're doing what you need to do to take your own climate action and manage your own anxiety is really important. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit more about these sort of three categories of ways to cope with climate distress. Um, we're still figuring out what to do with climate anxiety. We know that worrying about climate change is actually important because it can spur action. We also know that too much anxiety can be paralyzing and that that can impair action. We know that anger can actually be a really positive <laughs> motivator for climate action. Um, and so figuring out exactly sort of how to help um, what kind of anxiety is productive, what kind of anxiety is not productive, and how to get people from one place to another is, is an area um, where we need work. But why do I say this about encouraging collective action specifically? Um, there is some emerging data about this connection between climate anxiety and actual clinical anxiety or depression. So certainly not everybody who's climate anxious, anxious meets criteria for anxiety or depression, but there is some connection between worrying about the climate and clinical anxiety or depression. And this is some relatively recent data actually out of Boston. And the key take home from this study was that for people who had climate change anxiety, so anxiety about climate change that was keeping them up at night or causing them to stress or interfering with, or interfering with their function. It was specifically collective action, but not individual action that broke the association between being climate anxious or having um, climate change anxiety and depressive symptoms. So there seems to be something protect, protective, not just about taking action on climate, but specifically about taking action on climate in a way that's collective with a group of peers. So that is one piece of things to think about, encouraging collective action. And then when I think about where do I think the money's at in terms of helping all of us with our climate distress, I'm gonna bring us all the way back to um, a study that was done back in 2012 by Maria Hollow, who's a Swedish psychologist. This is a small study and um, she looked at adolescents, I think, you know, younger adolescents, 12 to 14, maybe, um, and looked at how they were coping with climate distress. And she chunked them into different categories. 
and talk about the sort of different types of coping, emotion-focused coping and problem-focused coping. Emotion-focused coping, the goal is really to improve your negative feelings about a stressor. And a great way to improve your negative feelings about climate change is just to believe it's not happening. <laughs> so these were kids who were in denial. But things like journaling, um, talking to a friend, expressing your feelings, those also would be forms of emotion-focused coping. There's then were problem-focused copers. Kids were like, I want to get to the source of the problem. And in her study, they were researching climate change and learning about it. But this would also be kids who do a beach cleanup or um, get all the light bulbs changed or encourage their school to compost or sort of whatever it is. And what she found was that emotion-focused coping kids had less negative emotions. They felt a little better. But unsurprisingly, they were less environmentally engaged as well. So they weren't taking action. So that's not our goal. The problem-focused coping kids sort of by definition were more environmentally engaged. They were doing things, but they actually felt worse and more, uh, more distressed about climate um, and what direction that goes in, you know, she doesn't say in terms of what caused the other. But then there's this third category of coping, meaning-focused coping. And meaning-focused coping actually comes from an older literature um, where they were looking at folks who were caring for spouses with life-limiting illness. So people who were in a situation where they had to continue to function, they had to continue to do what needed to be done, and they had to do that sort of regardless of the outcome. Um, and what Ohala found was the kids who were meaning-focused copers felt less bad, they had less negative emotions, and they were more environmentally engaged. And so what are forms of meaning-focused coping? It can be a lot of different things. It could be a faith background or a faith tradition. It could be drawing on your own sort of core beliefs and values. It could be existential goals. Um, it can also be sort of placing yourself in a broader historical context. This is a, um, an essay from a collection called uh, Not Too Late that came out last year, where um, the author Yota uh, Maram writes about, he sort of places the climate crisis and talks about his own family's experience as um, Jews who narrowly escaped the Holocaust. And he notes that, that this, that the experience of the world ending is not new and approaches it with humility, with the notion that we can't predict sort of what will happen in the future or sort of where we are at and, and places it, it, it in a broader context, noting that there's possibilities that we can't possibly see from here. That as humans, we have you know, been in tough situations in the past and we have not seen the way out and yet we have gotten out. Um, and this is like a great example of what meaning-focused coping can look like in action. And so um, the ways that we foster meaning-focused coping in young people and in adults is going to vary a lot from family to family and from young person to young person. But I do think that that's where a lot of the money is at. And then I just wanted to give one other sort of tip as we think about how to cope with our climate distress or our climate despair. And I wanna give credit to um, Emma Maris who writes, because she wrote about this back in 2020. But one of her points around how to cope with climate distress has to do with ditching shame and focusing on systems. And so what do I mean by that? Individual action is really important. Um, Individual action is what eventually forms collective action and means that all of us are getting solar panels on our houses, um, eating less meat, um, you know, driving electric vehicles, sort of all of the things. But sometimes worry about our own role in the crisis or about whether we're doing enough or not, I think I would call that shame, can interfere with us taking the larger action that we need to take to address the crisis. So I can't, you know, join a group, you know, where Dr. Pinsky talks about collective action. I can't join a group because I still, you know, drive a gas vehicle or, you know, I eat hamburgers or whatever it is. The climate crisis is our responsibility to deal with. 
we all need to be taking action. But the fact of the matter is that the problem is the system. And in this case, the, the fossil fuel industry. This is from the Wall Street Journal, which is not exactly a, a liberal rag, um, from back in September. The fact of the matter is that the fossil fuel industry has known about the damage that fossil fuel combustion was going to cause and about climate change for many, many, many decades. And there has been a very systematic um, um, campaign to deny, minimize, delay response, de delay response. And none of us as individuals are responsible for that. We do have to take action. It is now our responsibility to find a way out of it. But taking on guilt or feeling shame or sort of blaming ourselves for where we're at in the crisis is not helpful. And I do not think it's helpful with our mental health. So taking a step back and focusing on the system when you're taking your collective action, I do think can be really helpful. All right. And then this is just a quote from one of my favorite essays about that um, collective action piece of things. The belief that this enormous existential problem would have been fixed if all of us had just tweaked our consumptive habits is not only preposterous, it's dangerous. All right, so I have hopefully covered those four key points and I think I managed to leave plenty of time for questions. Um, first of all, climate change impacts mental health. We have those pathways of heat, pollution, and exposure to traumatic stress. Second, that more than anyone, children and young people are at greatest risk, but that not all kids are at the same level of risk. Third, that eco-anxiety matters. It is a problem, but it's not a mental illness. And fourth, that we have to address climate anxiety and climate distress in order to do what we need to do to get ourselves out of the crisis. Um, and with that, I am very happy to take some questions and have some conversations. I have resources. Um, I'll leave that up just for one second in case people want to take a screenshot. Um, and then these are some selected references, particularly for the health professionals who might be in the audience. Um, I already pointed out the Pereira and Nado article, which I think is really excellent. excellent. The Clayton report is also quite comprehensive for those who are looking for sort of more information about young people, um, mental health and climate. And that's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Pinsky. That was an outstanding tour de force presentation uh, and a running through a, a very relevant and very pressing topic. topic. Um, I wanted to start off with a question of my own um, uh, looking at the the city we live in, the city of Boise, has had a really challenging year this year. We've had three junior high and one high school student take their own life. Um, and I think it is difficult to parse out, uh, you know, specific contributing factors, but I certainly feel like there is, uh, you know, an amalgam of social media, uh, increased loneliness and decreased direct social interaction. Um, but also this kind of background climate anxiety, climate angst, climate, dis climate despair. Um, and I wonder if you could uh, share some thoughts about where communities like ours should be prioritizing interventions. Is it something where we uh, you know, need to take this meaningful collective action uh, to show kids that we care about what they're doing? Um, is it you know, task force, which we've started developing, looking at attacking loneliness uh, amongst youth. Um, what, what is the, the sort of biggest bang for our buck in a community like ours that's seeing issues like this while we're drowning in wildfire smoke and seeing hotter summers every year? Um, so I would say just first of all that I'm so sorry um, and what a difficult place for a community to find themselves in. Um, and it's also a really complex question as well. And I appreciate you noting that um, there are many, many factors that can lead to this, obviously not just for an individual, but also for an entire community. And that climate distress or more broadly worry about the future is one contributing element with a, you know, a whole sea of, of different factors that are going on. I don't know if I can answer the what is the biggest thing for the 
buck question, certainly not for a community that I'm not really familiar with, um, but even in, in general, I think that's a difficult question to answer. What I can say is that um, when I feel really positive and really excited about climate action, about um, action on climate and mental health, it is around the fact that the solutions for these problems really are multi-solutions. So we know, for example, when we think about climate trauma and the downstream mental health impacts of something like a flood or a wildfire, um, the people, what is most important in the immediate aftermath of a disaster is not your state government or FEMA or first responders or any of that. It is your neighbors. So what determines how well you weather a disaster, you know, whether you're injured, whether you get medical care, whether you have enough to eat, all of those things is about your community and about community connections. And those connections, that community infrastructure and social, social capital, what I would call it, that too is, I think, what, um, you know, you talked about loneliness. Enhancing social infrastructure, building con connections, and building community resilience is a fix for loneliness. It makes communities more resilient in the wake of a disaster. And it is fundamentally what we are going to need to do if we enact climate solutions. So climate trauma doesn't just impact individuals. It impacts neighborhoods. It impacts communities. It impacts entire societies. And as we experience more and more disasters and sort of cascading climate trauma, there's a risk that that will worsen social infrastructure, make it harder for neighbors to band together and for people to take care of each other. Targeting that now and enhancing community wellness and community connection and resilience, I think is a solution for a whole lot of things that are ailing us as a, you know, not just as a state or as a country or but sort of as a civilization and a, um, a species. And so I don't know what is the biggest thing for the buck in terms of whether it's more counselors in schools or more, you know, better, whatever. Um, but I do think that the solutions are probably going to vary community by community and they have to do with addressing that breakdown within, within community resilience, not any one individual. Um, there's many ways that as a society, we're not doing a good enough job prioritizing and taking care of our young people. That's why we're in a mental health crisis. Climate is one of those issues, but it's not the only one. Another side of that question, I guess, uh, as a researcher, how do you quantify the impact that climate change is having on uh, our mental health experience? Um, and kind of parse that out from all these other factors that are there uh, to, to show people that this is truly a, a cause and effect. Um, so I, do, I don't know that you can parse out what sort of what proportion of distress is related to climate as opposed to, you know, poop political extremism or sort of any of the other things that um, gun violence, any of the other things that we're struggling with right now, we can show that it's a problem, like with the Hickman data that I showed, and we can show that it is impacting people. Um, and we certainly, I hope, will get to a point where we can show that there are specific ways to help with it, specific things that can alleviate it. But I don't know that we can parse out what portion is related to climate distress compared to anything else. Um, I would also say, you know, climate distress can be what I call recruited in to mental illness. So there are people with OCD whose obsessions and compulsions come to revolve around climate change or, you know, resource scarcity or things like that. Kids who won't eat or drink because they know there's places in the world where kids don't have clean water and safe food. There are folks with schizophrenia or psychotic illnesses where they recruit in content around climate distress. That I think is very different from what we're talking about. 
but how, again, you can parse out how much is related to one thing, how much is related to another thing. I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I don't know if it matters as long as we all accept that it is important and that we need to do something about it. Um, it may be sort of a we can walk and chew gum type of thing. Great, thank you. I'm gonna pivot to some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question I had was, um, there we go. Uh, do you have any thoughts as to why people, in particular women and girls, have more anxiety during times of wildfire? So I think people are anxious in general. We know that people are anxious in general. And I think it stands to reason that when you, you know, look out your window in the morning and the sky is hazy and orange, um, that you would feel more anxious about it. Um, one of the like core reasons that climate change is so scary to us is that it's unpredictable. We don't know what's coming. Um, and knowing that there's a wildfire would, I think, make many people more anxious. Um, why it specifically impacts women and girls, I don't know. Um, I could, in general, women tend to be more worried about climate. Um, and I think there probably are a whole lot of sort of factors and reasons for that. But I would guess it's related to the fact that just at baseline, um, women worry more about climate change than men do. Thank you. Um, another and, audience. And I mean, I, what? I, say I felt anxious this, you know, when the, we had wildfire smoke here in Boston um, and I felt anxious, um, even though it wasn't all that bad here. It just, it's, uh, it's a disorienting and disturbing experience to realize that something that's happening so far away um, is impacting the air you breathe. I was actually in Boston during the, uh, the orange summer last year um, and felt uh, not anxious, but almost excited about having a dense population center, see what we've been dealing with out in the West for years and years and years. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it well, got you so much more publicity. New York got, yeah. yeah, it got so much more publicity when New York was having to cancel a baseball game than when Idaho yep. was closing national forests for camping for summer after summer after summer. <laughs> Um, so yeah. it was, you know, good, good to see in some ways that people, when it's in their backyard, will take some action. Um, yep. A question, we've, we've had a, uh, a couple of local students that have uh, become very engaged in climate activism, um, several of whom have been arrested for uh, taking things to an extreme. Um, and one of our mm -hmm. community climate leaders is asking, how can we inspire our kids to action without having them feel like their only solution is to take it to such an extreme that they get arrested when they feel, you know, these systemic solutions are out of their hands. Yeah. So I don't know what the extreme actions were. Um, and I would want to be very clear that I don't, you know, I, I presume that they were nonviolent forms of direct sure. action. Um, I, I would, um, I will be honest, because I'm a big fan of honesty, I would not dissuade a young person from getting arrested if that's what they felt sort of that their, um, you know, nonviolent direct action is what we do when political and sort of existing structures are no longer movable. And there is no longer a, um, there are no longer mechanisms within the system that will allow us to make the changes that we need to make. Um, I am not personally um, at a point where I'm ready to get arrested. And I also think that we need folks pushing on all directions and on all levers, including the financial lever. We all should be getting our money out of the fossil fuel industry, including the political lever, including the educational lever. And nonviolent direct action is another lever to try to affect change. There are effective and ineffective ways of doing it. Um, I don't know that there's one right answer about which actions are effective and which actions are ineffective and you often don't know ahead of time. Um, but uh, I don't know that, um, to me it is more important that youth climate activists practice self-care and pace themselves and um, take a step back from action when they find that they are running out of steam or sort of can't take care of themselves anymore that is more important to me than the specific 
form of action that they take. And I would not say, in my own opinion, that nonviolent direct action is specifically problematic if that's what young people feel is most effective for them. Um, another question. Uh, well, first, it was a compliment about uh, what a revealing presentation this was for those of us in the audience that teach young adults about climate change. What suggestions do you have about how to present mental and emotional health reactions to climate change without triggering those emotions in students? And I think you talked about this a bit in your discussion about how a presentation like this can be the very thing that makes people start doom scrolling. It's tricky, right? It's yeah. really tricky. So, I, I mean, I think one thing is to always be honest, right? And I, you know, I acknowledged right up front, this makes me anxious, it's scary stuff. Um, I would say focusing on solutions and remembering that talking about the doom and gloom does not actually <laughs> motivate people. Um, we're at an incredibly exciting and optimistic moment in history in terms of the solutions that exist. We have everything that we need. We have all of the scientists know how and everything that we need to bend the arc of the crisis. The problem is that we're not doing it. Not that it's impossible. It's not that we're doomed. There's no, you know, the problem is that we just, we need to, do the things that we need to do. So I think focusing on solutions and making sure that you're talking about those um, and, and, and acknowledging the emotions, I guess I already said. Um, and then I would say not worrying alone. Um, and so more than anything, I think, you know, we can, young people, kids, we can all cope with almost anything. Feeling like we can't talk about it or that we're alone with it is one of the hardest pieces of things. Um, and so making sure that, um, that you are acknowledging those emotions, not minimizing them and not pathologizing them is important. Um, the Climate Psychology Alliance North America, which is one of the organizations that um, I put in the resources list, also has recently come out with a guide to coping with climate anxiety for educators that is free online and that you can download. I don't, um, I confess I don't recall how much of it is geared towards young adults as opposed to like high school students. Um, but I imagine that a good amount of the resources and information would be applicable to both. Uh, one more question from the audience. Uh, I, I love the koala cartoon example. How do you think about diagnosing youth and adolescents who have who do have climate driven anxiety and depression when the external solution is so complex? So I I would say that you can you can your parents can have a horrible messy divorce and you can end up with you know sort of at increased risk and experiencing anxiety and depression. You can get bullied at school. You can have any number of things can happen in life that are rotten that can result in anxiety and depression. We treat that anxiety and depression or that PTSD, regardless of sort of what might have been the contributing factors for it. I think it is vanishingly rare for someone to present clinically with nothing other than climate anxiety that's truly impairing their function. Um, and so I would say the climate distress piece of things, we don't have to pathologize that in order to say, and also your function's messed up, you're not taking care of yourself, you're not sleeping. You know, obviously, of course, if someone is having really, really desperate or hopeless thoughts, we can treat those and help with those. It does, we don't have to eliminate or, or um, your climate distress in order to treat those things the same way that we don't have to make your parents' divorce not distressing in order to deal with depression or anxiety. I don't know if that answers the question. Beautifully, thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate all of your uh, insights uh, into how we can help those around us and ourselves, um, you know, stop doom scrolling, have a uh, portioned out media exposure uh, so that we're ingesting information from reliable sources, but not obsessing over things. Uh, I love the concept of giving up ownership and guilt uh, about the climate crisis uh, and, you know, turning that into action against the uh, systematic things that are driving most of the climate change. Um, you know, do your individual actions at home, 
take the wins that you get from uh, those individual actions, but don't feel like you're the cause of the climate crisis. Um, because I think that is something that most people I know in the climate space have dealt with in their own life. Um, you know, like when I drove my gas car here today, uh, I, I've, I've learned to stop kicking myself about driving that gas car because uh, I'm going to do other things that are going to make the world a good place. So thank yep. you so much for your and time. Close, closing comments. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. No, I was just going to say, and, and you're not the reason that the electric vehicle was hard to find and expensive and that the charging station wasn't there when you bought your gas vehicle, however long ago it was. That was the system that did that, not you. <laughs> Okay, well, uh, fantastic talk today. This talk will be available online uh, through the Cvent platform almost immediately, and then on our YouTube site within the next week or so. Um, uh, we will try to get some resources from Dr. Pinsky, maybe her slides, and we can put them on our, our uh, web, web platform as well. Um, so, Wonderful, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you, everyone have a great day. Yeah.